Good afternoon, everyone. This is Orca Student Reporter. I'm Akash here with Andreas and Nora, and we have with us Professor Mudasenka, a man of many disciplines. Perhaps you would like to introduce yourself, sir. Well, I'm uh, the chairman of the Mudasenka Institute for Development um, in Colombo, uh, which focuses on sustainable development in all its aspects. And I'm also a, a university teacher, uh, and I teach in a number of universities around the world. So, okay, so starting off with something completely unrelated to the World Resource Forum, potentially. Uh, recently, as far as physics is concerned, which was one of your disciplines at MIT, I believe, uh, we've discovered the Higgs boson and its existence. Now, would you be willing to perhaps give a simple definition of it, what it is out there to the people out there who don't know what exactly it is? And could you perhaps tell if it does relate to the question of resources, if in any way? Yeah, let me answer the second part. I think, I mean, as a physicist, um, when we deal with the fundamental laws of nature, you are never sure whether a discovery will have an immediate impact. But if you look historically over time, each fundamental discovery over time has led to a technology for its exploitation, um, not necessarily for the betterment of human beings. I mean, nuclear energy is one of them. When Rutherford split the atom early uh, in, the, in the 20th century, in the 19th, uh, people didn't quite foresee that you would need to nuclear fission and other things, uh, the kinds of nuclear reactors you have now to produce power, and of course the explosive power of the nuclear weapon. So it's a little bit like that. I think um, the search for fundamental truth is very important for the human side. Uh, whether it will produce good things for us or bad things, only time will tell. Now, in terms of the Higgs boson, I mean, we, I can't possibly summarize uh, that very, but basically, um, you know, in the physical universe, as we know it, you have fields. Fields are electromagnetic or other energy fields. And energy is also matter in another form. So associated, there is a Higgs field which is necessary for the present theory, which is called the standard theory of all the other particles. The existence of all these other particles requires something called a Higgs field, which is a background. And if you have a field, then there has to be associated particle. So the Higgs boson is the underlying particle of that field. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's bring this back into what we really wanted to talk about. So, as a Renaissance man, man of many disciplines, do you, do you feel that SCP, or the Sustainable Consumption and Production, how relevant is that in a world where there are questions such as poverty and perhaps even you know, financial crises? I mean, is it so important that we link it all together, or is it more appropriate that we deal at it one step at a time, dealing with one problem first and then the other? Should we more go collectively? Um, I think, I mean, I fundamentally believe that uh, problems of development uh, and sustainable development in particular are interconnected and we cannot deal with them piecemeal. I mean, there are countless examples where we try to solve one problem and make the other, pro other problem worse. Uh, the most recent one is the focus on corn ethanol, which in 2008 also led to a food crisis because people suddenly thought we could uh, substitute for oil with this, uh, this, all the production of corn output switch to this or major part of it and read to food riots and deaths in a number of countries. So the message here is that you need integrated solutions, but those integrated solutions are more complex because you have to deal with trade-offs. And uh, that is why people also have a tendency to go back to the magic bullet. That here is this problem, let's find a solution for that. But I would resist that. And that is why we have to link poverty, uh, hunger, uh, climate change, and all of them. And in fact, the challenge of finding win-win solutions is in fact 
uh, what will bring us to sustainability. Because those win-win solutions encapsulate the essential trade-off that sustainability is not optimization of one aspect, but the balance. And it is uh, a frame of mind where you talk about harmony. I mean, the Chinese were in China. Uh, you have to have a harmony, and harmony implies trade-offs. Trade-offs suggest that you have to have an integrated, a holistic way, view in which we are trying to solve a lot of problems at the same time. So the solution will not be perfect for any one problem, but on balance, everybody will come out better. Okay, so we just uh, we just came out of your entire workshop that I uh, concerned about sustainable consumption production, and uh, you talked a lot about having this um, let's say developing sort of a systemic approach. We deal with a lot of different things, and we try to incorporate you know development, the sustainability, and all these things together. Or could you just give a thirty second blurb on uh, basically summarizing uh, that to our viewers? Well, let me start backwards. Then I mean I have framework called sustainomics and there are certain principles that allow us to to begin the thought process because everything begins with a thought process. Really, the real world is all interconnected. Okay? There is no doubt about this. It is the human mind that tries to break it down and we have uh, actually modern science is a triumph of reductionist philosophy or that approach that we break everything down. But in the process of reductionism, for analysis and for understanding, we forgot that the parts are really integral. So coming back to that, we have now many practical applications of this approach where, in fact, that framework has been applied at a very local project level, at a sector level, even in terms of national economic model. And what are the principles? I mean, the, the most important one is the Sustainable Development Triangle, that almost everything has a balance between the economic, social, and environmental aspects. And we have models which try to integrate these viewpoints and harmonize. Uh, there are inevitably trade-offs. Okay? Uh, and the important thing is each community or individual has a choice. Somebody may prefer to emphasize the economic and money me. Somebody else may prefer a little more of the pristine environment. The third one might be interested more in the social inclusion. But each community and so on can make that choice as long as they for don't forget that it is the balance that is important and the interaction. That you don't neglect one at the expense of the other. Um, the other important point is more what I call uh, making development more sustainable, that principle, which is basi basically a call for action. I mean, it's basically telling people, uh, don't give up, don't think that these problems are so huge that I can't make a difference. We can make a difference, and particularly for young people. Uh, as I said, when you leave this room, you switch off the light, you're making a difference. You see a gum wrapper on the floor, you pick it up, you're making a difference. You can plant a tree. At the corporate level, you have all kinds of corporate social responsibility and other things you can do. Even at the macroeconomic level, you can model and incorporate and have an integrated approach. So uh, that the incremental approach is very important, and I think it has to counterbalance the other point, which is the vision. You have a vision of where you want to go. Let us say by 2030, you want to have live within the ecological capacity of one planet Earth, which we are at, at the moment exceeding by 50%. Uh, by 2030, you want to have a socially inclusive um, uh, uh, society uh, from a social viewpoint that is driven by social justice and where every human being has their basic human needs, but no starvation. You know? And you want to have a society, uh, an economy which is sustainable, which respects critical environmental and social needs. So you have to have a vision, but then you say, okay, step by step, how do we get there? And that is a very important point of making development more sustainable. And the third aspect which is equally important is what we have in our own minds, and that is 
uh, transcending natural barriers, particularly starting with value systems. We talked about in my lecture that we have a world that is now dominated by greed and selfishness, which has even been legitimized by the saying greed is good, no competition. Yes, some competition is necessary, but unless you have harmony and consensus to balance that, you are going to have deep trouble as we have in the financial system. You have to think in terms of the whole planet, spatially, uh, in terms of time, centuries, in terms of stakeholders, work with other stakeholders. So all those require significant efforts and multidisciplinarity in your analysis. All of this requires significant changing barriers of the mind. That means changes in education system, changes in, in high school and even at the kindergarten. Um, just speaking of that, I would love to talk a bit about the sort of models, models of policy and framework aspect. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't have time to go through your CG models. I would uh, love to see them. As economists, we you know, have loved them. That's models. what we got excited about. <laughs> uh, and I'm excited for the audience. It's uh, yeah, there's a there's the matter. But we did talk quite a lot about uh, accounting measures and you know, specifically economic indicators. And you mentioned here as well that you know you take you could take a step by step approach to to improve things. Uh, and then you're being a macroeconomist, if you'd like zoom out a bit and look at the sort of global scale of things, you know, we have a sort of a, an economy that functions very cyclically. Well, what way, you know, you people earn their wage, they can consume things, so that, you know, factories can hire people, you know, produce more things. Uh, and in the, the way a lot of producers look at this, obviously, okay, they look at economic indicators. GDP will grow, will, you know, by a certain rate. Uh, and you mentioned a lot about developing happiness indices, you know, in lieu of or perhaps not complementing the GDP values. Could you quickly talk about, uh, you know, sort of like a policy approach and how could we perhaps start transitioning towards such a, uh, let's say, it's such an economy where we start using other forms of indices and how perhaps how susceptible businesses would be to that and how we just how we get the ball rolling, so to speak. So right now we're still stuck in this. You look at these figures, these numbers, say these things. How, how, how can we put happiness into the equation, you know? Am I a little bit happier tomorrow? How do I measure happiness on scale? If I'm very happy, can I be happier than very happy? How does that, you know, take part in the whole equation? Well, if you're talking about a transition, I think we have to look at how we now use uh, models and economic structures. The, the present paradigm driven by material output and GNP uses the classic input output table which was developed by the employee. That is just material flows. Now, if we want to go a little beyond that into the transition, you have the uh, extended uh, environmental uh, economic accounts, the SEV, right? So now you have environmental goods and bads that are the result of economic activities as a side part, okay, which help you to understand that aspect. So you are becoming a little more conscious of the fact that uh, beyond material output there are other things that contribute to wealth. Then you have the approach of social accounting matrix where you go downwards, where you look at, well, all this wealth is produced, how is it distributed? Okay, across households, do the poorest households, does labor get a fair share of uh, the, the profits and so on. So that is another, the social dimension which comes in which is another indicator of is this uh, socio-economic system uh, sustainable or not? Is it functioning or And then you can even go beyond. You can look at how environmental goods and services are distributed across uh, income levels, across households. Because we know intrinsically that the poorest households always live in the most environmentally degraded neighborhoods. We know it, but we don't measure it. That is an, an also a byproduct, a, a, a result of that is additional misery. So the poor are not only uh, economically or monetarily poor, they are also environmentally deprived, and they are socially excluded. So gradually, you begin to broaden these indices getting to a fuller measure of well-being happiness is I think even a step. So I mean I think over a period of time we can broaden the indices the same way that was done with the human development index and so on. 
that we have some experience over time, how to measure it, and then we can track these indices and so on. Then we have to persuade decision makers that these are important uh, and to replace GNP and so on. Now, on the modeling, I mean, very quickly, it's this. G the CG models are, for me, just a broad indicator. I mean, they tell you, uh, they give you a, a consistency framework that uh, when you tinker with one part of the economy, uh, you should know what is happening as well. It's a kind of a Walrasian uh, type of framework. Okay. But if you want to go into the detail, you have to have uh, link it with sectoral models which are much more detailed, which have not CG, there may be other types of models. And it could go right down to the community and the project level. So you have a linked cascading set of models. Uh, it's not just not running one humongous CG and expecting everything to come out of it. So that is only for macro decision making, but you have meso decision making and you have micro decision making. Very quickly, I would like to talk about the Millennium Consumption Rules. Uh, you put forward the idea of introducing them, and uh, you argued that richer countries should reduce their consumption levels in order not to crowd out the development of the poor countries. And I was wondering, who count as rich countries? Because even within Europe, there are, the, there are so many divergences between the countries. Between I personally come from Eastern Europe, and there the consumption level is it's much lower than, than in Western Europe. So who, who count as rich countries in your view? Well, I think the question could be reposed because the Millennium Consumption Goals apply to rich people, irrespective of where they come. So if you have 50 million people uh, in India who are rich, which is the equivalent of a good-sized European country, then they are subject to the same uh, constraints as a rich people in a rich country. So it is, uh, in a sense, it will cut across nationalistic uh, self-interest. Uh, the, so the question of which is a rich or a poor country is not, but income level does. And the, the, key, the other key point is, is that the rich are better educated and more influential. So if you convince them that sustainable consumption is very important. And the key argument is this. The rich are at the top of the pile. You basically argue that this whole mountain is collapsing, that they will fall the furthest if it collapses. So they have a stake in changing uh, their behavior. Uh, and this is the whole argument. And then uh, the, everything else will follow in the sense that um, I think if consumers become more sustainable and particularly the more affluent consumers and producers will also have to follow. And I think we build a self-sustaining group. So that is the point about Millennium Consumption Goals and the difference that you also rely on a bottom-up approach. And in fact, the bottom-up approach is much more successful. We have the Millennium Consumption Goals Initiative where you have not only individuals, but communities, cities, companies, where uh, you have the leadership saying with greater confidence, we don't have to wait for national leaders to tell us. Uh, we can reduce our water footprint by 50% uh, by 2020, or energy or greenhouse gases. And since these mayors or CEOs of companies are closer to their people, they can do this and make those commitments and put it on their website with greater confidence. So I feel the bottom-up uh, part of this is much more successful and eventually when national leaders suddenly find that all the cities in their country have some kind of target, they say, no, I can also do this now nationally. Yeah. They find it easier. So I think both the bottom-up and the top-down go together. If we wait for international agreements as we saw at Rio 20 or the Durban Climate Agreement, I think we'll be waiting a long time.